Hello, and welcome to the State of 911 webinar series hosted by the National 911 Program. My name is Sherry, and I will be the moderator for today's session. This webinar series is designed to provide useful information for the 911 stakeholder community about federal and state participation in the planning, design, and implementation of next generation 911 systems otherwise referred to as NG911. It includes real experiences from leaders utilizing these processes throughout the country. Today's session will feature presenters from the Crisis Text Line and the Minnesota Department of Public Safety. Mr. Garrett Shotwell, a Crisis Counselor Supervisor and Active Rescue Lead, will discuss how Crisis Text Line helps public safety answering points collaborate to aid people in their time of need. Ms. Dana Wahlberg, Director of the Minnesota Department of Public Safety Emergency Communication Networks, will offer an overview of the state's regional approach and share pointers on how to create a successful communications plan. For more information on National 911 Program webinars, or to access archived recordings or learn more about the National 911 program, please visit 911.gov. Feedback or questions can be sent to national911team at mcp911.com. If you are experiencing technical difficulty with the WebEx application, please call WebEx Technical Assistance at 1- 866-229-3239 and select option 1. Please note that all participants' phone lines have been put in a listen-only mode and this webinar is being recorded. To ask questions of our presenters, feel free to take one of two actions. Using WebEx's chat feature located on the right-hand side of your screen, Enter your question at any time during the presentation and it will be entered into a queue. This feature is not visible while your screen is in the full page expanded view. Or to ask your question live, use the raise hand feature and to request that your phone line be unmuted and you will be called upon to ask your question. With that, I would like to introduce Ms. Lori Flaherty, coordinator for the National 911 program. Lori, please go ahead. Thanks, Sherry. Uh, I'm so appreciative of having both of these people with us today. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your expertise. Our first session will feature Mr. Garrett Shotwell, who is the head of supervision and active rescue lead at the Crisis Text Line. The Crisis Text Line offers free 24-7 support for people in crisis all via text messaging. So his presentation will provide an overview of this quickly growing service and will include information about how PSAPs are collaborating to save lives and support suicidal individuals via text message. Mr. Shotwell, the floor is yours. Hi, good morning everyone or good afternoon depending on where you are. Um, I'm located in Seattle so it's morning here still. Um, but first of all, thank you both so much for the introduction and also inviting um, me in Crisis Text Line here this morning. Um, so today's goal really, again, is just to provide an overview of how our two worlds intersect. Um, and, and, and you'll hear the word active rescue um, throughout this presentation, but I'll go into a little bit deeper dive into that. Um, so again, my name is Garrett Shotwell, and I'm a social worker, um, supervisor, and active rescue lead. Um, at Crisis Text Line, and the Active Rescue Lead um, is really what we call, um, we've generated a cross-functional team within our organization, so um, you'll learn that we're actually a tech company that does um, mental health work and has this weird, um, kind of some way accidental intersection with um, the PSAP 911 world. Um, so. The Active Rescue Lead, we have people from data, we have our training team, we have supervision, we have members of our exec team, and we um, solely focus on how we can make active rescues better and kind of bridge the gaps between our two worlds. Um, we mitigate 
risk, risk factors, um, and we really just try to be a part of the conversation. So that's that's kind of a weird active rescue lead thing, but that's some insight as to what that is. Um, and if you want to move on to the third slide, um, we can go into a little bit of what we do. Um, it's pretty simple. An individual simply texts 741741 um, and they're connected with a crisis counselor. And our goal is to do that within five minutes. Um, and again, we're free, 24-7, anonymous. We train all of our crisis counselors in-house. We have approximately 4,000 crisis counselors right now um, all over the country. You can move to the next slide. Um, so a little bit of insight of where we came from. Um, we were born out of the rib of DoSomething.org. And if any of you have heard um, of Do Something, it's one of the largest youth change organizations in the nation. And in 2012, our founder and CEO, Nancy Lublin, um, who was then the CEO of Do Something, received a text message um, from an individual. So they sent out these text campaigns trying to motivate teens to um, donate to the local, local food banks. Um, and they received a message that says, are you there? He won't stop raping me. It's my dad. Um, and so as a result, Nancy was like, we need a crisis text line, and we need it yesterday. Um, so the inception, that's how the inception was born. Um, and then in 2013, crisis text line launched really quietly in Chicago and El Paso. Um, no marketing, just told about 200 people in each area about it, and within four months, every area code had texted in. Um, and so, as you can see, we've grown really quickly um, from the very beginning. Um, and one of the unique things about us, well, it's not unique to organizations, but it's important is that we're really driven by data. Um, so if you look at the slide, you can see that a majority of our conversations happen between 8 p.m. and 4 a.m., um, and that we skew really young, poor, and rural. So what that tells me as a social worker is that we're there when people need us, um, when maybe agencies are closed or they're not surrounded by their friends or support, and we're providing access to people who typically um, have, have trouble with that. And you can move on. Yep, okay, great. Um, and so we also collect issue tags. Um, and so some of our top issue tags are depression, suicide, self-harm, family. Um, we can also, you know, pull from the robust data. Since it's all text message, um, we can see the top locations that people talk about, school, bedroom, car. Um, we're really driven by our data in, in a big way and also um, from an organizational standpoint. Uh, so on the next slide, you can see how we use the data to make, our, to make the world better. Um, we have something called crisistrends.org, which is also free. Um, feel free to check that out. And, and through that, you can see, uh, you can click on your state, you can click on time of day, you can click on issue tag, you can click on day of week to see what people are texting in about. And this is really important because it helps drive um, the services we provide within our community. Uh, and this, this number is a little out of date. Um, but the, the 54 million, we're, we're upwards of 60 million, I believe, but that's how many messages we've exchanged since 2013. Um, we also provide open data collaborations, which is really just an opportunity for big organizations um, to obtain a keyword um, and, have, and promote that keyword to have their individuals in their community text in using that keyword, and we'll release a unique data set to that individual. A good example of that would be um, having a university uh, having a specific keyword. We're, we're going to launch um, here shortly a Seattle keyword, um, so that way we can provide more information to um, you know, the, the powers that be. Um, we also use data to make us better, and this is where um, 
on the next slide is where it kind of we, we hone in into the active rescue piece where our worlds collide. Um, so I mentioned earlier that we are a tech company. And so we use the data that we've learned to create an algorithm to stack our queue based on priority and severity. Um, so we know that someone who uses the word ibuprofen is 16 times more likely to result in an active rescue, meaning um, a supervisor like myself will be contacting uh, a peace app to let them know that someone's at risk. Um, we also use our data to collect data on our active rescues. As you can see in this middle middle image, um, that's Slack, which is a, an application we use as a team to communicate. But we also use it to collect data, and it's updated every day. And um, it shows us our total number of active rescues we've done, which this this slide's a little out of date, in that we've done almost 11,000 since 2013. Um, um, we see our daily average, and yesterday, um, some real-time information. Yesterday, we did 30 active rescues across the country. Um, Monday from 8 p.m. to midnight are our highest risk days for whatever reason. Um, and it also shows our 28-day average. And we also have started to collect um, information on which peace apps we use the most, um, where where are the biggest demands coming from? And so as you can see at the last picture there, um, just shows how many our top key saps over the last week. Um, so on the next slide, we really focus on active rescues, which is where our worlds collide. Um, and so I wanted to talk a little bit about our process. Just to start, active rescues are always our last case scenario. Um, we only call in active rescues if the texter has desire, plans, means, and a time frame within 24 hours, and, which is the big and, is unwilling to safety plan. So between the imminent risk and, and the and and unwilling to safety plan is where the crisis intervention comes in, where we as supervisors are coaching our crisis counselors to really help de-escalate situations. However, if that is not able to happen, then that's when we um, contact peace apps. Um, and it only happens for about 1% of our conversation. So we do, let's say on average, maybe 70,000 unique conversations a month. Only about 1% of those will be called in. Um, so on the next slide, it's, it's really for those visual learners uh, like myself. Um, you know, just a, an overview of how our procedure works. And it's, it's, it's a team effort. Um, and we have many, many safety nets in place to, to catch everyone um, that needs help. So one of the safety nets we talked about was the, uh, the algorithm that prioritizes risk. And, and in addition to that, it also comes in a different color. It'll come in as what we, it's a code orange. It's a literally orange conversation that this person is at risk. So a texture will text in and work with a crisis counselor. And if it's decided um, that an individual is at imminent risk and unwilling to safety plan, a supervisor will search for uh, the correct PSAP and then eventually call for the PSAP and hopefully um, get, get the texture some help. Uh, so on the next slide is a little bit of a deeper dive into our procedure. Um, so the crisis counselor, again, flags the supervisor. And just to give you a little visual of how it works, we call our conversations monopoly card. So for instance, I worked last night on the, the high risk day of the week. Um, at any given point, I was assigned 10 to 15 crisis counselors in my screen on my computer, I could see every single one of their conversations, um, which ranges anywhere from 10 on slow days to 40 on really busy nights where I can see all of these conversations. And so if a conversation is flagged for me um, and I confirm that the texter's imminent risk um, of suicide or homicide and unwilling to safety plan, um, the ideal situation will be the texter provides the location. Um, I think we, we all know one of the first things um, 
that we do whenever you all answer the phone or we call in and it's like, what's the individual's location? And it's the best way to get someone help quickest. And uh, so that's ideal. So if, if someone gives us their location, then we're able to research that quickly and, and get them the help that they need um, and we're brave enough to reach out for. Um, but here's the tricky part whenever the texter does not provide the location. Uh, we are able to pull the texter's cell phone number in most instances, and then based on their cell phone number and the three-digit number, um, the area code and the three-digit number after that, look up the area code to find a general location. And this is where we know that there is a lot of room for error. Um, it's been described to me before as throwing a dart on a map, <laughs> um, which is sort of what we have to do, and it's, it's a place we start. And, and at that point, we advocate for, um, you know, really anything that can be done based on the information that we have. And so on the next slide, you can see that we contact the PSAP. Um, we kind of explain the situation. And since we aren't um, first responder approved from the FCC, then we can't, unfortunately, contact the phone carrier, the wireless carriers, um, so we have to have to kind of ask and, and plead our case sometimes of, of why we're asking a PSAP to execute an extension circumstance. Um, and so hopefully, you know, sometimes we, we get it right and it's within the jurisdiction and dispatch, um, a safety check is dispatched. Um, but if not, then, you know, we kind of ask if, if they can guide us. Um, so it's pretty collaborative, especially once things lead into an active rescue. Um, but as you can imagine, we face a lot of challenges. Um, you know, we don't have that first responder status, and so we can't contact the phone companies. And so sometimes it can take a really long time um, for us to get someone help. Um, and, and honestly, everyone's just doing their job really well. We're just trying to get as much information as possible. So this is where I think we have a lot of opportunity for our worlds to intersect and to work together to get people help quickest. Uh, so internally, since we are a tech company and we have access to engineers, we're, we're working actually a brief just got passed from the Active Rescues team um, to provide uh, what we're calling a verification link. So what this link would do would we'd be able to send it to someone at risk and we, they would feel empowered to click on it. Um, and we can confirm their location just to give um, another opportunity and another tool for us to use to um, help find people quickest. And so that is a general overview of what we do and kind of where we're working on. And yeah, I'm super open to collaborating. If you have any questions or at the very end, you can see my email address and also our emergency services email. We have a page on our website that um, you can click on it and sign up for our monthly newsletters. Our first monthly newsletter, I believe, will be going out in March. Um, you can also sign up for a, a toolkit to kind of share more of what we do. And um, yeah, so thank you so much. And I am open for any questions that you all may have. Thank you, Mr. Shotwell. Sheila, um, do you want to proceed with the questions? Yes, thank you, Sherry. Um, our first question for you, Garrett, is do you stay on the phone line with the PSAP while also communicating with the texter? It depends. Um, some PSAPs want that, some people don't. Um, and it really, I suppose, is just whatever capacity the PSAP has. Um, in most instances, we're calling after the texture has disengaged. Um, so either they've opted out of our services and we can't reach out to them, or they're still on the line. Um, we have, I believe, 29 full-time supervisors right now, and we are all willing and open to stay on the line. And sometimes we, you know, there's all if there's a gray area, then this work will find it. Um, so sometimes we're calling the PSAP and we're like, this is the situation. Um, do you have any advice? Like we're more than willing to take advice and also deliver that to the texter if it comes to that. 
Thank you. The next question, how is your organization funded? That's a great question. Um, we're privately funded. Um, yeah, so it, we are, Nancy, one of her superpowers is raising money. Um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is a huge funder. Um, yep, so we're privately funded. All right, thank you. Um, the next question, um, while the top issues are about individuals, have you received any requests for help in the after events of hurricanes or other natural disasters where 911 or text to 911 were not available? We do. Um, so we, we always try, you know, we have a very specific definition of crisis, but it really just, it, it goes, it revolves around um, if you're unable to cope in a successful and healthy way. Um, and so we definitely get texts from any natural disasters or um, let's say if a school shooting happened, we try and um, connect on that intervention level and so the emotional piece to that. But we do occasionally see like, I need 911 um, and, and I can't call them. And so our goal is also not to be dispatch, um, mainly in that our goal is to, to not contact um, police on behalf of someone. So if someone's really, really looking for um, that, we'll, we'll try and empower them to call. But, you know, there's always instances where um, if we can confirm that it's uh, a legitimate um, kind of request, then, then we can do something for a third party, but it makes it tough because we're, even if we're calling on behalf of a texter, then that's technically a third party, so one more removed makes it even more complicated. So um, we, we try not to do that as much as possible. We try to empower the texter. Thank you, Garrett. Um, when refer referencing um, circumstances where you do lookups, are you simply looking for subscriber information or are you going as far as pinging cell phones? Right now we're just doing subscriber information. Um, and one of, I don't know if any of you have received a call from someone at Crisis Text Line, but um, usually when we just have that, we start off by stating who we are, what's going on, and then just really validating, like we know this isn't a lot of information. Um, but unfortunately we can't ping a phone at this point point in time. However, we are kind of working on things that we can do in the interim, such as the verification link, um, to try and empower people to give us their location. Our next question, is there anything you need from the PSAP community? Yes, and I don't know. <laughs> yes, and that we definitely do. Um, I think there's a huge a, a, a void. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity for co collaboration. Um, but again, and the I don't know is that, you know, that we're always open to maybe we're not asking the right questions, maybe we're not doing something correctly. Um, we really, again, kind of accidentally fell into this world, and we definitely want to be more proactive than reactive. So, um, Yes, and you let me know. I don't know. Email me about it. All right. The next question, um, how are you working with social media? Um, in terms, I guess that's a big question. Um, we, hmm, yeah, I guess I would maybe want some more, more insight to, to what they're looking for, whoever asked it. Um, do you have social media pages and those types of things that you use to share your message? We do. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, so we do. Uh, we have a LinkedIn. We have a Facebook. Um, I believe we also have an Instagram. We have historically not done tons of um, advertising or promoting. The, the Active Rescue Team actually did 
um, of the like 300 top peace apps across the country did a, an old school mailing at the end of last year. So if you received a random piece of mail from us telling you who we are with like a coffee mug in it, that was intentional and on purpose. Um, but but yeah, we um, we don't actively do it, um, but it's we definitely have that preference. Okay, well, if that is all of the questions, I want to thank you again, Mr. Shotwell, for sharing information with us. And I will ask Lori to please go ahead and introduce our second speaker. Thanks, Sherry. Our next speaker is Dana Wahlberg, who is the Minnesota's uh, Director of the Department of Public Safety Emergency Communication Network. It's been my pleasure to know Dana for a number of years. And I am always grateful that I don't have to keep up with her. Um, if you know Dana, you know she's just capable of doing 87 things at the same time, and she does them all extremely well. Um, I've been involved in a number of projects with her, and um, she is a force of nature. So, Dana, thank you so much for giving us your time today, and please go ahead. Thank you, Lori, for that kind introduction and the warm welcome. Good day, everyone, and thank you for um, joining this webinar and being willing to listen to what um, both Garrett and I have to share with you today. Um, next slide, please, Sherry. So um, Minnesota decided back actually in 2014 when we were doing our strategic planning efforts with the Statewide Emergency Communications Board which is our statewide governance structure, um, that we wanted to provide text to 911 as an option, uh, primarily in response to the FCC mandate as an alternative method for accessing 911 for those who are deaf and hard of hearing, or in a situation where speaking might create danger for a person. So um, the first thing that we did in response to that was go out to RFP, and um, we wanted to procure a text to 911 vendor that would offer us uh, a statewide solution using one vendor. And the reason that we wanted to use one vendor was so that we could provide consistency in training our PSAPs and in uh, PSAP operations across the state. And we also wanted to go with the integrated CPE solution rather than having it be either the uh, TTY or the web-based solution. So in keeping all of that in mind, we were trying to walk the fine line between being on the bleeding edge of deploying, but we did want to remain an early adopter. So um, while our RFP was out, we met with all of our PSAPs, and, and we meet monthly um, across the state as part of the next gen um, committee. And we specifically requested that no PSAP procure a solution independently and um, that we wait to deploy as an entire state. So um, we were very grateful that our PSAPs were willing to go that route, and uh, we also agreed to follow a regional deployment model. So rather than having uh, certain counties, we have 87 counties and 104 PSAPs in the state, and rather than doing it piecemeal, we wanted to offer a statewide solution, fully understanding that because we have a, a vast array of CPE makes models and versions across the state that everybody couldn't go at once. Um, the state does not have a single CPE vendor for Minnesota. Each PSAP is able to select who they prefer for that service, so um, we knew that this was going to be somewhat of a challenge to get everybody to go at the same time. So our goal was actually to achieve a statewide text to 911 solution by the fourth quarter of 2017 by deploying at least one PSAP in every region. And Sherry, if you'll go to the next slide, please. That shows the, um, the way that the state of Minnesota is broken up. We have the seven regions, and 
Um, these Minnesota PSAPs are accustomed to working within these regions. They've done so since 20, or 2014 when we first migrated to a statewide 800 megahertz LMR system. So working with counties in their region is, is comfortable for them. And um, one of the things that we committed to was that through this solution, the state would pay the monthly recurring cost for the awarded TCC vendor, and the PSAP's responsibility would be to pay the, um, the cost to either upgrade or replace their existing call handling equipment. And we do provide them with uh, monthly funds that may be used for this purpose. So, um, they, did, they do have that money that they were able to use for their replacement or upgrade. So going on to the next slide, um, in December of 2016, the TCC contract was awarded to West Safety Systems. That was really a lengthy process. It was a component of a larger RFP that included network and um, IP selective routing. So it was um, challenging at times to keep that moving forward. But we, we had that successful um, award, and starting in January of 2017, we really went full speed ahead and, and were very grateful for the support that we had throughout this process from mission critical partners who serve as our professional and technical services vendor in the state of Minnesota. So uh, there was really more to this than just working between the PSAPs and the TCC vendor. We had to also work with the call handling system vendors, and of course, Comtech, who is the TCC vendor for um, T-Mobile and Verizon carriers. Um, Airbus, with their uh, Vesta platform, or even with some of their older models, um, accounts for about 80% of the CPEs in the state of Minnesota. And then the West Viper system that is um, used um, or pro provided by CenturyLink as a channel partner to West in Minnesota um, services about 15% of the state. So far above and beyond um, our Airbus and CenturyLink West with CPE handling equipment in Minnesota. So we knew that we wanted to focus primarily on the two of them to keep the um, deployment moving forward. And if we go to the next slide, we will see that um, we underwent a fairly substantial planning effort that started with completing PSAP surveys with the idea of a t determining which PSAPs were actually even an option to be uh, readied to receive text. And from the um, initial surveys, we've, we were really challenged sometimes to find even seven regional PSAPs that, that we were going to be able to get upgraded and ready to go. But we did, we did accomplish that. And from that process, we created first a technical requirements document that really laid out the interconnection requirements between the uh, CPE to meet the integrated text to 911 platform. So it, it kind of helped PSAPs understand what steps they needed to go through with their vendor and what their responsibilities were to be able to get their CPE even up to speed to be able to get into queue to deploy. And from that, we then created a statewide deployment plan. And that was really kind of a, um, it, it outlaid the responsibilities of the PSAPs, of the, um, of the vendors, and of the 911 provider, as well as the TCC provider. So it was really kind of a timeline. And it, it helped keep us on track. Um, it, it really became our, our, um, our Bible, if you will, on, on where we were and where we needed to go, identified where our risks were, where we were falling behind. And it was a way also for us to keep the PSAPs informed of the process so that they were able to um, 
determine when they when it was time for them to be prepared and to um, to deploy. And then finally, we created a carrier test plan that really outlaid where we were going to test, what we were going to measure, how we were going to document those uh, results, and how we were going to communicate anomalies in the testing process to all of our constituents. So with that in mind, um, going to the next slide, with all of those things in place, then next we wanted to create a comprehensive communications plan. And we're very fortunate in the state of Minnesota um, that our office has a dedicated public information officer through the Department of Public Safety Communications Office. And she was assigned to the project and worked diligently to help us create a communications plan, which um, also helped us um, identify our key audiences, the key messages, who was going to communicate those messages, how they were going to be communicated, and in what time, time frame we were going to communicate them. There were certain um, constituents and stakeholders that we wanted to keep in the loop, and that was primarily our legislators and the deaf and hard of hearing community. We really weren't as interested in keeping the media apprised because we it was our goal right from the beginning that we wanted to do a soft launch and we wanted to be able to do so before the public really knew that this was a service that was available. That might have been one of our biggest challenges. However, we were successful in meeting that goal and through the entire year 2017, um, from the, the beginning of the year until December 5th when we actually went live, we were able to keep fly under the radar, so to speak, and um, the media did not. There was a couple times that I had a call from somebody that got wind of it, but between Sherry um, from Mission Critical Partners and myself, we were able to um, encourage them to not go forward and make an announcement until we were ready in the interest of um, maintaining public safety across the state. So that really worked well for us. Um, we did include many of the speaking points from the NENA public education reference document in our campaign. Um, the call if you can, text if you can't slogan was um, adopted and I think that is a phenomenal message. It's, it's easily understood and it has helped us immensely. Um, we received regular questions from the PSAPs that were going to be going live in this first round, serving as a regional point of uh, receipt. So as we would take their questions, we would document them, record the answers, and then regularly distribute those answers to the regional PSAPs. And any changes in the answers that might come as, as technology or situations would change so that they always had um, collectively the most current information in a written format which we had hoped would mitigate any misunderstandings. We also provided monthly updates to our Next Generation 911 committee. Um, this committee is a structured committee under the Statewide Emergency Communications Board. They're very active. They're, um, there are representatives from every region on that committee, so that was another mechanism that we could not only keep the regional PSAPs up to date, but the rest of the PSAPs who were eager to learn how the deployment was um, going and trying to determine for themselves at what point they wanted to throw their hat in the ring to go next. We also held regular meetings with our deaf and hard of hearing community partners. And I think this is, if I can give you any advice if you have yet to deploy, this is something that I would really consider. These folks want this service, they need this service, and if you partner with them, they will help you along the way, they will be your best advocate. And if you don't do that, um, they will become perhaps suspicious or concerned, and that's when, you know, it, it, it may be um, not as beneficial for your deployment. So these folks have been invaluable to us and, and um, we've included them every step of the way, including um, having them on hand for our um, media announcement and we've incorporated them into some uh, videos 
both a 15 second and a 30 second video and they have been appreciative of that and have been very, very respectful and have spoken positively of the deployment in Minnesota. Next slide, please, Sherry. We also had regular meetings with the regional PSAPs um, in the form of conference calls. In some situations, we would invite the vendors to be part of those calls so that they could ask their specific questions right to the vendor. And in other cases, um, we had meetings just with them so that we could talk about um, their own issues and concerns. Our geospatial office worked to provide a geospatial PSAP boundary map that they could overlay onto their existing um, CAD maps. We don't have a statewide geospatial data set yet, but our team worked hard to come up with um, a clean PSAP boundary map so that at least when um, a text would come in, we w would hope that the coordinates that we're displaying were at least falling within the correct PSAP boundary area so that the receiving PSAP would know which PSAP to contact to pass the call or the text on to. And that has been, um, we've had a lot of positive feedback on that. A week before each PSAP was scheduled to go live, we had an individual call with them and it was really more just to let them know. By that time, everything was set. They knew exactly what to expect. But this was more of just a, a reassurance and a pep talk and to let them know that we were gonna be with them every step of the way and that um, they weren't kind of being thrown out um, on their own. Um, we provided them with media talking points prior to deployment in the event that the media should contact them. They had statements that they were able to share um, about the deployment that would kind of again protect us from having it go, going public before we were ready for it. And then we did provide them with media packets prior to the official go live announcement and each of the regional PSAPs was made a media contact so that uh, their local media could come directly to them rather than having to reach out directly to our office to get um, the specifics about the deployment. That being said, we thought that we had done a super stellar job of keeping everybody in the loop and keeping everybody organized, but don't ever think that you're over communicating because um, one of our key messages all along was once you have um, been connected to the TCC successfully, please train because you'll get short codes that you can test with, you need to prepare your dispatchers and have them feel confident in the solution because after successful live carrier testing, we intend to keep you live in the soft launch so it's very possible that you will receive a real text. We thought that we had communicated that message until we were blue in the face. However, um, we had to turn one piece up back down after successful live testing um, because they weren't prepared, they didn't understand that um, that they were going to stay live and they actually wanted us to delay our go live date across the state um, to give them more time. And they however did step up to the plate rather quickly when we let them know that um, our next steps would be to find another PSAP or PSAPs to take their calls for their region. So we didn't have to go that route, which was a good thing. Um, so in the end, we had um, all seven of our regional PSAPs set to go, and that was a very rewarding personal experience and professional experience for, for me as a, a leader in the state of Minnesota. Um, Sherry, if we go to the next slide, we'll talk next a little bit about our deployment process. So uh, the first step was was doing the TCC connectivity and testing, which was really relatively simple. The network connections were established between each PSAP. And then um, that was the point where we really stressed the 911 dispatcher training component. Our um, work group 
under the a subcommittee group or work group underneath the next gen 911 committee um, met together regularly to compile an operational standard which was really uh, to lay out how the PSAPs would handle um, the text to 911. And in doing that, they gathered information from early adopters on best practices. Um, they gathered information from TCC providers, continued to work with the deaf and hard of hearing community to understand um, unique um, wording or applications for them. And then um, they, they wrote the standard, and it was subsequently adopted by the committee, the Next Gen Committee, and then subsequently by the Statewide Emergency Communications Board. We understand that this is still kind of a work in progress and that as technology changes and additional um, features are capable within texting, for example, when we migrate away from uh, SMS to maybe um, other platforms or uh, are able to implement real-time text into the mix that, that that, you know, that operational standard will need to be able to be adjusted to accommodate those new features. But for now, we have a consistent operational standard. So when a regional PSAP answers a text and it has to be passed off to a non-live texting PSAP, there is a consistent process so the um, respective staff know what to expect. From there, we went to the carrier provisioning piece and notified the four major carriers that we were ready and that they could complete their network configuration to accommodate the proper routing. Um, it was a little bit challenging at first to help the carriers understand that um, one PSAP was was taking um, text for a number of PSAPs, and we had to make some accommodations and adjustments to our shapefile boundaries to make sure that they had um, that all configured properly. But when we went to do the carrier testing, um, we, we did um, ensure that all of the routing was accurate and inclusive. We actually worked with every um, PSAP manager in the, in, the, um, in the live environment to make sure that they had input into the testing locations that we selected across their region. And so we, um, we had some very long days doing the drive testing, but it was also rewarding and it was amazing to see how really positive all of the regional PSAPs were. They were very easy to work with. They were uh, very accommodating, and all of that went really well. So we were in a soft launch status, 30 days. Our, our seventh PSAP um, was in the soft launch uh, status along with everyone else um, 30 days before we made our um, big announcement and we held our press conference on December 5th of last year, and we had several media on hand for that, as well as uh, members of the deaf and hard of hearing community. And we had um, closed captioning, we had um, ASL translators, so it, it, was, it was really quite um, a successful event. So um, wrapping up here, um, I'm going to go through the next slides relatively qu more quickly. There's some of our first uh, successes. Um, shots fired, and, and the person doing that had a microphone that was not working on their phone, so they didn't have an option other than to text, but it was a successful call. It was a, a real call, and um, there it resulted in an arrest. We've had intervention for persons with um, mental health crises, uh, domestic calls, pretty much the standard um, gamut of what is expected in the 911 environment for receiving texts. We did have one hoax right out of the chute. A 17-year-old young man texted 911 basically as a hoax, um, making things up. And then when the dispatcher asked him to stop, he, he challenged them to find him, and they did. And he went to jail and was arrested for 
uh, false call to 911 and underage consumption. So hopefully he went to school the next day and shared that with all of his classmates. Next slide, please. This kind of gives you the overall of our texting statistics since we went live. Um, you can, you'll notice in September we only had a couple of, well, we only had one um, piece that, we had two piece ups that went live, but only one of the two had received live text in, in the um, soft launch. And then you can see it increased in October, November, and December as more went live. Um, the results from Minneapolis, um, PSAP are kind of expanded because they really have worked with their dispatchers to continue testing and, and training after they went live. So about 75% of those calls are test calls. But that kind of shows you where we've, where we've been since we went live. And going to the next slide, um, I'm going to touch just briefly on our public education. Um, our objective to, was to use a mix of earned media and paid media. The earned media, of course, being the uh, folks that were on hand at the announcement and those that did follow-up stories as a result of that. And our paid media just started here the week of, um, right before Super Bowl. And our um, we did an RFP. We hired an advertising firm. They the, con the firm that received the award has had a lot of experience doing um, work for the Department of Public Safety. They did a fabulous job in creating the tactics that would provide a statewide reach and the maximum number of impressions. Between February 1st and the uh, middle of March, we anticipate having 120 million impressions um, between billboards, um, tents, bar tents, in um, or table tents, excuse me, in in bars, uh, we have skyways in Minnesota. Many of you probably don't know what those are because you don't live in this horrible cold weather. But most people prefer to walk indoors as much as possible. So we have little bridges over the streets, and many of those have advertising billboards in them. So we have capitalized on utilizing those as well in addition to social media and digital video. So the next slide uh, displays our actual graphic message. And it, it's really exciting to drive down the freeways and see these um, lighted signs, as well as the static billboards. Um, if, and the link there, um, if you feel inclined, will bring you to our um, web page that will give you additional information on our programs, and particularly on our our text to 911 information. We had some lessons learned. Uh, TCC connectivity took longer than expected. Call handling equipment upgrades took longer than expected. Basically, everything took longer than expected. But we're here now, and we're happy, and we're continuing to move forward. I encourage you to make sure that you work with your CAD and mapping vendors um, if you're working with an integrated solution to um, explore ways that the coordinates can plot from the call into your mapping application to assist your dispatchers in location. Um, use your own test phones. Go out and do your own testing. Don't use flip phones. We thought we could get by using flip phones at a decreased rate, but we discovered that even our youngest staff folks are not text savvy any longer when they have to hit the um, one key three times to get the to the C. So um, use use decent phones. And then um, as a side, one of our lessons learned um, as a member of the interstate playbook, I um, wanted to do a little bit of exploring. The purpose of the interstate playbook group is to um, achieve interoperable um, improvements in. Um, between states. And so as we were out testing, we did some um, interstate tra text transfers between Minnesota and North Dakota PSAPs. And we did that because we are both using um, West and CenturyLink as our 911 system and network providers. And we were successful in being able to transfer text with information coordinates 
um, between Minnesota and North Dakota PSAPs, and that was really exciting as well, and something that our dispatchers really appreciate because for years and years, um, there's, you know, what separates Minnesota and North Dakota is the Red River, and they are very much accustomed to passing information back and forth, and um, this is very much appreciated by, by them. So with that, I'll leave you with a photo of our first deployed PSAP, and the three folks on the, in the front and right were the staff there, and the smiles on their face are just pretty much indicative of, of all of the um, PSAPs that we worked with. It's, it was a pleasure to be part of this for all of them, and we look forward to migrating the remainder of our PSAPs. We have, we have 15 live PSAPs now, and then and we are working to deploy as many as we can between now and the end of the year. Um, the regional PSAPs have engaged in a um, memo of understanding that between the time that they launched as a regional PSAP and December 31st of 2018, that the PSAPs that they're answering for will either have a plan to take their own or will have made a formal plan to um, engage into a longer-term relationship with another PSAP, which may or may not be the regional PSAP. So that about does it, and I will be happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, Dana. We will go ahead and start the QA portion of our session. Sheila? Our first question asks, what's the number one lesson learned in this statewide deployment? I think communication. Communicate to your PSAPs, communicate to your stakeholders, uh, communicate with your vendors, whether they're the call handling vendors or the, um, the TCC vendor, and do that, you know, in as, to whatever extent you're able to do it in a group setting, be it a conference call, and then um, follow up with of summaries, written summaries of what was discussed to, um, to disseminate to anybody that didn't maybe be able to attend the call or who might need to see it in writing to help it sink in. There's a lot of technical things happening and when you're working with multiple vendors and stakeholders, everybody's um, impressions or understandings or perceptions can be a little bit different and so again, um, there is no such thing as over communication. The next question asks, did you use a consultant to develop the RFP and deploy the systems? Yes, we did. Um, Mission Critical Partners assisted us with the, um, the drafting of the RFP and the, as I mentioned, the, uh, the TCC provider um, portion of the RFP was one segment in what was, you know, a, a much larger RFP that included um, ESINET services, IP selective routing, and if I were to have the opportunity to repeat the process, I think there might be some value to doing the um, RFP for the text to 911 solution separately. I think we got bogged down a little bit in the rest of the components of the RFP and weren't um, as expeditious in moving forward as we would have liked to have been. The delay in getting the overall RFP awarded, um, and, and we didn't necessarily intend to or, or uh, make a commitment to choose a single vendor. It just kind of worked out that way. But the deaf and hard of hearing community as well as some of the other stakeholders were, were starting to become concerned about the length that the process was taking. And it was difficult for them to understand that the delays just kept happening. It took um, about a year and a half to, um, from the time we started the RFP until when it was awarded. So if, it's, if there's a way to do just the, that, um, I would encourage that, and we'd certainly be willing to share the portion of our RFP that, that was um, devoted to that solution. Our 
next question has two parts. The first part is, are the PSAPs receiving location of the texter on all texts or just a subset? Um, they are receiving a location, a Latin long, on every text as long as it's coming from a traditional wireless phone. There have been a couple of cases where um, they've received uh, what appeared to be a text from an app or um, uh, another service like the, the medical um, alert type devices where they haven't received anything but an incoming, the, the, an incoming text, but they haven't been able to communicate back and forth with that either. And in, um, you know, they report all of those types of things to us, and then we've tried to work with the vendors to track them back. And, um, you know, that there are those few anomalies that come through, but for all intents and purposes, they are getting a, a coordinate. The coordinate is, however, typically very coarse in that it is not as accurate as a phase one wireless call is. And with your answer, you did answer the uh, second part of the question, was, which was, has location been reliable for the telecommunications? Yeah, well, and you know, it can be. There were some instances where we tested and the, um, the dispatchers told us, you know, you're in the parking lot at Dairy Queen. And that tended to be most accurate with AT&T for whatever reason. Um, but it, it, you really you can't count on it, and that was that's something that is um, paramount in our messaging is that um, you know it, it should only be used as a first contact option for individuals who are deaf, deaf, blind, hard of hearing, or with speech impairments, or when they can't safely make a voice call because you know it isn't. Location is not as good, and of course, it takes longer. All right. Well, I want to say once again a big thank you to both Ms. Wahlberg and Mr. Shotwell, and ask Lori, do you have any closing remarks? I'd also like to say thank you to our two speakers. I don't know if everyone on the line has seen the new report that the FCC released last week, but in that report, they state that. 46 states, the District of Columbia, two of the territories are all, they've all reported that some portion or all of their state is uh, currently, you know, receiving text messages to 911. And by the end of 2017, we're approaching 2,000 PSAPs who are text capable. So clearly, this is a, a technology that is on the rise, and uh, it is going to become even more important to all of us as time goes on. So thank you very much for sharing your, t your experience and your expertise. Thank you, Lori, for the opportunity. All right. This concludes today's webinar. We appreciate everyone's participation. An archived version of today's webinar will be available on 911.gov soon. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.